There's no denying that our contemporary lives are collaborative. From the, project, from the products we use to the beliefs we hold, the team-written television programs we watch, and the anonymously edited online encyclopedias we consult, our experiences are highly mediated by a diverse array of voices and influences. We're not the solitary arbiters of our own fates. Rather, we work in concert with a broad array of collaborators, incorporating others' ideas and voices into our own lives every day. Over the years, scholars have advanced many different metaphors to address the collaborative nature of our lives. In the 1960s, Claude Lévi-Strauss wrote about the bricoleur who artfully recombines whatever is at hand to produce brilliant, unforeseen results. The bricoleur actively challenges the model of the lone genius auteur, instead positing that we are all drawn on a fixed repertoire of shared pre-existing materials, which we can only repurpose and never augment. Levi Strauss termed this distinction as the one between mythical thinking, which recycles known tropes, and science, which believes it can make something new. Unlike Levi Strauss, Donna Haraway does not see the world of science and the world of myth as mutually exclusive. Instead, they mutually constitute each other. Taking a more science fictional tact in the 1990s, Haraway suggests that rather than bricoleurs, we are cyborgs, a hybrid of machine and organism, a creature of social reality as well as a creature of fiction. This dualism manifests itself within the individual and within the system of society, blurring the boundaries between man and machine, experience and technology, and leaving nothing untouched. Like Livy Strauss, Haraway issues the concept of uniqueness and originality, favoring instead a polyvocal, postmodern existence that embraces permanently partial identities and contradictory standpoints. More recently, the Matsutake World Research Group, a diverse collective of anthropologists and scientists, has used the Matsutake mushroom to describe the importance of intersubjective perception in our collaborative process. For the members of Matsutake Worlds, the structure of this rare Japanese mushroom, which func functions symbiotically with its host, becomes a pe metaphor for not only the plant's ecological, economic, and cultural significance, but also for the group's own collaborative efforts. Rather than subscribe to the commonly held academic belief that only single author scholarship can be original and valid, the Matsutake World Research Group poses the idea that collaborative and interdisciplinary work is vital to the survival of academia, as well as to our understanding of the world around us. While we find each of these models to be useful in its own way, we'd like to advance yet another metaphor for collaboration, that of the exquisite corpse, the familiar surrealist parlor game in which prose is composed Mad Lib style through anonymous joint authorship. The way that the surrealists originally played, and this is a little different than the way we play it now, um, is that each participant would supply a specific part of speech, and then by ordering these semi-randomized words, they'd create a narrative. Um, these narratives, at turns funny, poignant, and nonsensical, can be seen as representative of life in the 21st century. Begun in 1920s France as an offshoot of Dada, the Surrealist movement is perhaps most familiar to contemporary audiences in the paintings of Salvador Dali. Uh, however, although they aren't as well remembered today, writers like André Breton, Paul Éluard, and Pierre Reverdy uh, created a rich corpus of Surrealist literary texts. Breton was, for all intents and purposes, the movement's demagogue, publishing several treatises on Surrealism's tenets and playing social secretary to a bevy of like-minded artists. As such, we're going to defer to Breton's definition of the movement, quote, surrealism, noun, psychic automatism in its pure state, by which one proposes to express verbally by means of the written word or in any other manner, the actual functioning of thought, dictated by thought in the absence of any control exercised by reason, exempt from any aesthetic or moral concern, unquote. Breton and his cohort were fascinated with psychic automatism and Freudian dream states. Many of the classics of Surrealist literature, such as Breton's collaboration with Philippe Soupeau, Les Champs Magnétiques, or The Magnetic Fields, uh, were written in an automatic manner. Although the final products were often highly edited, the method was one that endeavored to channel unconscious thought without resorting to cliché, which Breton despised as, quote, so many superimposed images taken from some stock catalog, unquote. But despite the surrealist obsession with Freudian psychology and the unconscious, surrealism was not, as contemporaneous critics like Jerome Klein claimed, quote, a deliberate cult of nonsense and confusion, unquote, nor was it an attempt to escape reality. 
In fact, the word surreal suggests a layering on top of the real, something super real, which Breton defined as, quote, the resolution of two states, dream and reality, which are seemingly so contradictory into a kind of absolute reality, unquote. Far from seeking to escape reality, surrealists uh, created exercises like auto automatic writing and the exquisite corpse to use nonsense and what Pierre Reverdy called the, quote, juxtaposition of two or more distant realities, unquote, to achieve a sort of derangement of the senses, which they hoped would in turn expose the very tenuous boundary between the real and the imaginary. The Surrealists have taken a lot of flack over the years for their quixotic quest for the perfect realization of unconscious genius, but in an era in which crowdsourcing is a viable way of delegating work, the idea that valuable material can arise from unknown and perhaps even mysterious sources begins to seem less ridiculous. There is something remarkably oracular about the unnamed editors of Wikipedia and the trolls of 4chan. Though they may not have the mystique of the oracles of old, they wield a similar authority over the flow of information and opinion in contemporary internet culture. And of all the surrealist obsessions, the exquisite corpse especially offers a remarkably accurate metaphor for our way of life in the 21st century, not only in the practical representation of our experiences, but also in their philosophical implications. The exquisite corpse derives its name from a sentence from the first game ever played, le cadavre exquis boira le vin nouveau, or the exquisite corpse will drink the new wine. Uh, and the game was a popular diversion amongst the surrealist set. Since Breton's time, the concept has been applied to a variety of forms, including visual art and writing workshop exercises, which is where I think most of us have perhaps encountered it. Uh, the version of the game it, that is most familiar to us today is played by writing one sentence on a sheet of paper and folding it over to hide the work from the next participant, revealing only the last line or last few words uh, of what has been written to serve as a prompt for the next player. So you pass the paper to the person uh, next to you and they continue the story from there. Once the bottom of the page is reached, the work is considered complete. As Herbert S. Gershman points out, the surrealists were drawn to games as, quote, a formal construction which shuts out one reality while creating another, more nearly ideal one, unquote. In this respect, games like the exquisite corpse were a perfect way of accessing Breton's absolute reality, becoming more than merely a game, but an extension of a new way of life being created. Whether we realize it or not, the juxtaposition of two more or less distant realities is part of our everyday experience. We are constantly synthesizing a multitude of influences to create our own private surreal state. For instance, as we were writing this paper, Carly and I were separated by nearly 300 miles, um, and we never met face to face until we came to this conference. Um, but during the weeks that we were writing this, we emailed, chatted, and called and text messaged our way to this thesis. And when we finally sat down to write the actual paper, we saw each other's words and revisions appear in real time in Google Docs. To create this Frankenstein of a lecture, we would alternate paragraphs, sentences, and ideas flowing naturally from piece to piece as inspiration, or as today drew closer necessity took us. Many of us are aware of the formal collaborations we engage in such as those between colleagues or between artists, whether it's duets in music, writing based on visual art, or vice versa. But often we don't lend as much credence to the kind of collaborations we participate in in everyday life. This is a mistake. Collaboration infuses even the most quotidian aspects of our daily lives, and our very existence is as collaborative and winding as the Surrealist's exquisite corpse itself. Our lives are filled with unacknowledged collaborative efforts. Some of these collaborations are timeless. Learning is perhaps one of the most salient examples. As Sandra Dolby has pointed out in her study on self-help books, all learning involves the conscious synthesis of others' opinions into our own system of beliefs. Each book we read, each movie we watch, and every person we talk to on the street serves as a stimulant, a catalyst for creating an individual response. Whether it's done for our academic or professional betterment, or for personal enrichment, we're constantly engaging in intellectual collaboration with those around us, and it's through this exchange of ideas that we gain our categories and questions. In this respect, even our beliefs and opinions are not wholly our own, but the result of a shared practice that stretches across time and space to encompass many historical and cultural perspectives. Other collaborations are the result of our increasingly globalized economies. 
The objects we use from day to day, our clothes and our household items, are largely made by complete strangers. Medical procedures and technologies developed in foreign countries appear in our local drugstores and electronics emporiums. And with the advent of the internet and vastly improved communication systems, we have a nearly unlimited ability to share ideas collaboratively. When I'm looking for a good recipe, I can crowdsource uh, options from my Twitter account. As in the exquisite accords, the dessert that I make is not mine alone, but the combined product of the recipe writer, the Twitter responder, and anyone who thereafter consumes it. Commerce, too, reflects a collaborative spirit now. Anyone can instantly start their own business using PayPal on any website to collect funds for services or products. And even less tech-savvy entrepreneurs can use any number of platforms from eBay to Etsy to Amazon to sell their wares to ready consumers. Creative projects can be funded from, through programs like Kickstarter, where anonymous donations from supporters around the world can help make independent ideas a reality. But perhaps one of the most striking examples of the collaborative nature of contemporary life today comes in the form of blogs. Bloggers post daily entries about their lives, sometimes revealing deeply personal details to create a narrative or non-narrative work. A quick scan of these lifestyle blogs on any given day could cover what he ate for breakfast, an announcement that she's pregnant, an interesting new song, a to-do list, a discussion of owning a small business, or the best color for a couch in a studio apartment. Each is carefully crafted, showing a very real life, if only select aspects of it. And after we read for a few days, months, years, it's easy to feel that we know this person. Rows and rows of comments on each entry, some from friends but most from strangers, form their own exquisite corpse as readers offer their feedback line by line, adding their own stories and augmenting the work in their individual ways. Unlike the exquisite corpse participant, the blogger ultimately has control over who, over which comments can be viewed and by whom, but very often these com commentators create a discussion that's as interesting or more interesting than the original entry itself, and the author has to exercise some restraint to allow the work to fully blossom. In these, and in many other ways, uh, our lives today unfold in much the same way as the exquisite corpse. The exquisite corpse asks us to relinquish, to a large extent, our ability to control the outcome of our own stories. We're not the lone genius authors of our lives, the sole agents of our own destinies, but nor are we the hapless victims of chance. We are active participants in a never-ending game, the outcome of which we can influence but never predict. We do not have a clear view either of the circumstances under which our own actions are taken. The paper has been folded over and we have only the merest suggestion of this full syntax that has come before. In the 21st century, with unprecedented access to historical sources, one might think that we know where we come from, and to some extent, of course, we do. However, despite the need, uh, the speed with which technologies are changing, the motives of others may be just as much a mystery to us today as they were 50 or 100 years ago. We often participate in these exercises blindly, accepting what comes to us without fully understanding whose fingerprints mark the products and information we consume. There are, however, limits to the utility of this comparison. Significantly, the exquisite corpse moves in a unilateral direction across the page. Life, on the other hand, moves in as many directions as we can imagine. In life, we progress forward through time, but the direction we take is up to us. There can be no erasing on the exquisite corpse, no going backward or to the side. And yet, in so many ways, the exquisite corpse is an exquisite metaphor for our own modern lives. We feel sure that the collaborative nature of contemporary life would please the surrealist, since, as Catherine Conley and Pierre Temineau point out, surrealism was, quote, a way of walking down the street, of engaging oneself in politics, of dreaming and living in the everyday, unquote. Although it has since been relegated to more obscure corners of literary theory, Breton originally intended for surrealism to be not just a style, but a way of life. For the, the surrealists, there was no appreciable boundary between the world of the imagination and the world of everyday experience. As Breton put it, quote, what is admirable about the fantastic is that there is no longer anything fantastic. There is only the real, unquote. Today, we are all too keenly aware of this. With massive global networks at our fingertips allowing for instant communication, the system ceases to feel enormous and instead gives us a sense, perhaps false, of closeness. In mere moments, we can connect to anyone, starting a blog with strangers, sharing our photos with friends, or working on a spreadsheet with colleagues across the world. 
Once we acknowledge the impact these connections have on our lives, it becomes clear that the separation between the real, the scientific, the autonomous, and the surreal, the mythic, the collaborative, is an imaginary one. The more we relinquish this mistaken distinction, the more we can begin to embrace the beauty of the fantastical hybrid lives we lead.